thanks everyone for coming. Uh, my name's Rob, I organize Idea at IPO. Uh, we've been doing events in Silicon Valley for a number of years. We hold events multiple times a week from San Jose to San Francisco. So again, I'm grateful that you're all here tonight. You could be doing lots of fun things. You could be playing tennis, going for a bike ride, going to the gym, or you could be watching a certain speech that's on TV right now. Instead, you're here. You know who's speaking tonight. Yes, I don't. Anyway, that's okay. You're here, and I'm glad that you're here. So uh, we have a busy, busy calendar of events. I'd like to highlight two events that are coming up. This Thursday in Palo Alto, March 2nd, How to Successfully Pitch to Investors and Get Funded, featuring angel investor Gary Jenks. A little bit further on down the line, March 16th in Sunnyvale, How to Negotiate with Venture Capitalists and Win. So that's uh, going to be an outstanding program. Check out all the details on our site, ideatoipo.com, and all the other events that we have on our calendar. We were launched officially on February 1st, 2010. At that time, we had no members, no events on our calendar. At this stage, we have over 50,000 members among all our meetup groups in the Bay Area. We've completed over 1,702 events. By any standard, by any measure, we're the most active, most prolific startup event organization in Silicon Valley, bar none. Is that it? Okay. But let me expand on that. So if we're the most active, most prolific startup event organization in Silicon Valley, and Silicon Valley is the global center of entrepreneurship and innovation, that would make us the most active, most prolific startup event organization in the entire world. <laughs> Still a little, little weak, but uh, that's okay, I'll, I'll take it. Our mission is to promote entrepreneurship, support entrepreneurs, build community, and provide value in the Silicon Valley startup ecosystem. To that end, we provide content that is practical, actionable, and relevant. Stuff that you can actually use to succeed as entrepreneurs. We believe in building community because Silicon Valley is an aspirational ecosystem that attracts people from all over the world who come here to do great things. Who here is not originally from Silicon Valley? Who here was born and raised in Silicon Valley? Just you guys? Okay. Uh, so whether you are a native or you arrived last night, it's important for us to provide multiple channels for you to meet people, build relationships, and grow your network. In fact, we have a regular TGIF mixer, thank God it's Friday, every few Fridays at the Hyatt Regency Santa Clara. It's hosted by CJ Terrell, one of our team members. Uh, he's not here tonight, but uh, we have one this coming Friday, March 3rd. So, hope you guys can make it. It's a free event, and, uh, you know, who's got plans on Friday nights? I didn't think so. So, you're welcome to come check it out. We've got plans for you. With regard to value, it's important that we provide value at each and every one of our events because, first of all, we know many entrepreneurs are struggling financially. So we make sure our events are affordable. And if you cannot afford the cover charge, come see me. Uh, we always need volunteers to help us manage our events. Volunteers can attend for free. Now, we can't have everybody volunteer, but uh, just come see me, and we want to make sure everyone gets a chance to attend and become a part of what we do. More importantly though, well, let me expand on that. We also want to make sure that we have a decent meal at each and every one of our events. Was this meal decent? Yeah. Uh, we want to thank uh, Sherman and Sterling for that fine meal. Let's hear it for Sherman and Sterling. Uh, next week it's back to our usual menu, which is Costco pizza and grapes, but we uh, had a little reprieve this week. More importantly, again, with regard to value, we want to make sure that you get value for your time, which is your most valuable resource. Anyone here getting any younger? I didn't think so. So when you invest your valuable time to come to our events, we want to make sure that you maximize your ROI. We have many partners that help us do what we do. Law firms, venture capital firms, angel investor groups, incubators, accelerators, colleges, universities. Lots of players in Silicon Valley. Tonight, once again, we're grateful to Sherman and Sterling for hosting us at this beautiful venue 
and they're a great partner, and we look forward to many more events with them. So again, let's hear for uh, Sherman and Sterling. A few of our other partners are here tonight. I want to have them come up and say a few words. Let's hear it for uh, Long and Aptology. Uh, good evening. My name is Good evening. My name is Long, and I am the co-founder of a company called Aptology. We are a uh, local software company. We've been in existence for about six years, with about four to five hundred customers, ranging anywhere from restaurants to HP, Shutter Health. Um, I myself have been in the Bay Area area for only about 20 years. I've made a lot of people actually billionaires, but I was young and stupid and worked for them instead of making myself rich. <laughs> um, so we do... So, I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Is that better? Okay, should I start over? <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, again, my name is Long, and I'm with a company called Anthology. We are a software company that's been in business about five plus years. We have about 500 customers ranking work from restaurant to HP, Shutter Health, etc. Um, we do anything from website, e-commerce, blockchain, etc. So if we can't do it, we're one of the few shops that says we can't, but uh, we'd love to hear about what it is that you need. A lot of my experience all co really comes from working with people like you, what to do, what not to do. So um, it's actually very valuable. And uh, not only do I do this, but I also have my own app, so I can share that with you. I myself have personally been in the Bay Area for about 20 years. I've made a lot of people billionaires when I was much like, younger. I was too stupid to work for myself. So uh, you know, companies like FedEx, Citrix, um, I made them millions of dollars. So, um, again, I love to work with you and make us millions of dollars. So, uh, our customers range anywhere from health, cannabis, sports, um, you know, gamification. We have all sorts of customers. And they're also looking for partners and investors. That's the other thing that I do. And lastly, I can also help you with the sales and traction. That's probably going to be the most common question that you get. Do you have any sales? And the challenge is that most of us don't have millions of dollars. And I've worked with a lot of clients like you to get you the traction that you need on a very little dollar. And I repeat, very little. I didn't say zero. So don't come with me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm good, but I'm not that good. So uh, that's it. I'd love to buy you a cup of coffee, learn about your ideas, and see if we can help each other. That's some refreshing honesty there, huh? All right, next up we have uh, Brian from Cloud Brigade. Hi, everybody. I'll be real quick. I'm Brian Phelps uh, with Cloud Brigade. I've been partnering with Rob for a number of years now. I would consider myself a, a um, customer acquisition specialist. So I'm a 30-year veteran here in the Silicon Valley, worked with many, many startup companies, putting together uh, sales and marketing plans, inbound, outbound, for multiple industries. Um, I'm an online marketing certified professional, so I'm up to date on conversion optimization, best practices, uh, paid uh, search, organic search, uh, analytics, etc. I'm also a certified uh, technician for Amazon Web Services. Our company provides both um, web application development services and managed services for cloud. So if you have any questions whatsoever about any of those areas, please come see me. And my card is up there at the table. So thanks for being here, and thank you very much for, to our panelists. <laughs> Next up, we have Mike from CTO 911. Hello, my name is Mike with CTO 911. I've been helping entrepreneurs here in Silicon Valley uh, for many years. I help them with their ideas and take that vision and, and the domain expertise that, that you have and turn that into working software platform that you could, into product that you could do, that, that you could sell. Um, 
and bring in a lot of value as well. So I help um, with the uh, architecture design uh, application, uh, the, uh, creating the process, um, setting up the teams, uh, recruiting if you need it, local or remote. I've hired um, hundreds of people here in, the, in San Francisco before. And uh, I also manage teams overseas. And if you need help in those areas, I could definitely help you. Um, uh, I also do mo mobile app developments in both ways. Uh, if you don't want to hire both an iOS and Android at the same time, I have a solution for that too, um, to create that. Um, I also uh, have some consultants that are doing uh, data science and machine learning. If you need resources, I have some, a couple of PhDs working for me and um, uh, several other consultants as well. So if you need help, I'll be glad to talk to you. My car is in front or you can come shake my hand. I'll be glad to talk to you. Thank you. So though our local mission is to help entrepreneurs here in Silicon Valley, our greater mission is to democratize entrepreneurship and innovation all around the world. To that end, we have a robust YouTube channel, youtube.com slash idea to IPO. We have tons of videos. We've documented many of our events, and this rich, valuable content is available on demand, anytime, anywhere, totally free of charge. Whether you're in Menlo Park, Palo Alto, Maui, <laughs> Moscow, or Timbuktu. Who's been to Maui? That's it. Who's been to Moscow? That's it. Who's been to Timbuktu? I thought Ed's been to Timbuktu. Anyway, the uh, point is, all these places have Wi-Fi. Anywhere you have access to Wi-Fi, you have access to the great content that we strive to produce every week. And we believe that great entrepreneurs can come from anywhere, not just Silicon Valley. Our partner in this endeavor is Tim Jeggers, one of the top professional videographers in all of Silicon Valley. Let's hear it for Tim. Thank you. Thank you for having us also. Uh, yeah, I'm Tim. I'm the videographer for Idea IPO. I do a lot of independent work. I do weddings, all kinds of stuff. I keep busy. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much my whole spiel. Uh, we can talk more about that later if you're interested in any multimedia content production. Uh, just one thing I want to ask everybody is during the panel discussion to please refrain from asking questions. At 8 o'clock we'll open up this podium where you can ask your questions. And until then, just you know, refrain and hold your excitement back and let them do their thing. And then you can pry away and get all the knowledge out of them you can. So thanks again for having us. And I'll give it back to Rob. OK, so once again, uh, we're going to get started with panel discussion. Uh, we're going to do the panel discussion until about 8 o'clock when it's time for Q&A. Uh, line up here, ask your questions. And we'll wrap up the formal program at roughly 8.30. And uh, as a courtesy to our host, uh, we'd like to leave the building by 9 o'clock. So without further ado, I want to pass the program off to our distinguished moderator. He is one of the top intellectual property attorneys in all of Silicon Valley. He's a partner here at this firm. Most importantly, he is passionate about helping entrepreneurs succeed. So let's hear it for uh, Matt Berkowitz and our panel. <laughs> Okay, is this on? Yeah. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate that. Um, we're going to uh, introduce our STEAM panel in just uh, just a moment, but before we do, uh, I just want to get a show of hands um, to see who here is familiar with machine learning. Great. Okay. Um, who here, uh, maybe this will be a smaller subset, but does anybody use machine learning uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in the course of their, their business and their work? Okay, good. So pretty, a pretty fair amount, uh, which will hopefully give the panel some, some guidance here as we go through. Um, okay, so with that, with that in mind, I, I want to just uh, go down the line and, just, and, and ask the panel um, to, to introduce themselves, give a, give a little bit of background um, about what they do and, and their connection to machine learning. So, Jose, take it away. Thank you. Hi. Um, <clears throat> good night. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Jose Luis Agundas, and I am... Uh, uh, with at and I'm an assistant uh, vice president of Big Data Innovation, which means I run a team uh, a split in between uh, Palo Alto and San Francisco dedicated to exploring new concepts and new possibilities of big data and machine intelligence and security, trust, and privacy, and a number of topics. And uh, I have a blast in my, in, my, in my time here, so three years uh, so far. 
um, in the in the Bay Area and enjoying every minute of it. Prior to that, I was working with um, Telefonica in, in Europe and understanding how big data and, um, uh, and data in general uh, needed to be um, made aware to the general public because, of course, this was something new coming to the people and there was a lot of reactions um, ranging from fear to uncertainty to doubt and anything in between. So a lot of the things we did, also we had to dedicate a lot of time to communicate. So that's, um, uh, even though I'm, I'm a computer scientist by training and my life has been uh, mainly in the, in, in the technology business, um, I, I'm moving more and more and more into explaining uh, what the, I'm sorry, thank you. They couldn't hear that. Okay, thank you. We're suspecting something like that. <laughs> okay. So um, basically, um, uh, communication of something new coming to the general public is uh, something I'll be speaking about because I understood that that was a big piece of the what was what I consider to be a technology thing happening, big data, turned out to be a communication piece as well. And I think that is there's something there as well with artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, that we will need to train and make aware the awareness of the general public before this can be something trusted, understood, and and that something can be built as an economy around it. Thanks. Yeah, just if we could just try to stay close to the mic. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. Uh, I'm David Gerster. I'm the VP of Data Science at Big ML. Uh, and I go around and I give a lot of talks and a lot of demos, and basically I try to get across the concept that uh, machine learning is not hard, or it doesn't have to be hard. Uh, and so uh, that's really my big theme, and as we see ML continue to enter the mainstream um, and become accessible to a wider audience, um, I think there's a big opportunity to just make everyone's lives uh, a lot easier. Hi, my name is Ed Fernandez. Um, I am an investor, entrepreneur, advisor, uh, long time uh, corporate executive in the mobile industry. Uh, my journey in venture capital started um, five years, almost six years ago, with uh, a small micro venture fund uh, out of Europe, investing in 11 companies. One of our exits was uh, Olapic recently, last year. So very happy with that. We also had. Uh, had uh, write-offs as well, so like uh, everybody else, I guess, in this <laughs> industry. And then my journey into machine learning started a couple of years ago when, when I was uh, uh, driven into it by uh, uh, all the uh, trends and all the reports that were saying how big machine learning, how impactful it was going to be in the different industries. So actually, um, I started machine learning uh, by the hand of uh, Svi Acheler, which uh, uh, there is a company uh, here presenting called The Optimizing Mind. So he was so kind to, to help me understand the specifics around machine learning. Then, uh, for full disclosure as well, I became an investor in this company, in BML as well, so very happy with, uh, with that decision as well. And uh, also to have the full picture view of uh, what machine learning can do in, in different, in different uh, aspects of, of the industry. Hi, I'm Patrick Allen. I'm a chief scientist at Loop AI Labs, and uh, we're an AI startup in uh, San Francisco. And what we do is, uh, our slogan is helping machines understand the human world. Um, and we do that mostly through language understanding, where there are lots of documents in the world that people would rather not have to read, and have machines read them instead and just give them a synopsis of what's in them. Um, and so that's what we're doing at Loop, um, starting off with companies that have mostly large amounts of data, large numbers of documents. Um, so I've been there since 2013. Before that, I was at AT&T, like Jose here, uh, but in a different group. I was at AT&T Labs, um, working with them on uh, speech recognition and natural language understanding systems. Um, but I'm glad to be here tonight. Thanks. Thanks for thanks, everybody. Um, David, I'll, I'll come back to you since you were the one who said that machine learning should be easy. So um, should be should should be. So uh, for for the audience, I think you have a, maybe a sense of some people are familiar with it, and some people aren't. But can you can you tell us what it is? I mean, make make it easy for everybody. <laughs> well, let's see. 
I think the common thread when we're talking about machine learning is uh, that you're taking a data set, a training set, you're presenting it to an algorithm. The algorithm is finding hopefully useful and meaningful patterns uh, in that, dating, in that uh, training set. Uh, there's obviously a lot of different ways to skin that particular cat, um, but that seems to be the common thread. And um, if you look at the way Big ML is organized, um, you upload your data, and then there's a variety of algorithms you can apply to the data. It shows you the output in a sort of visual, interactive way. Um, and that's uh, kind of what you're trying to do, right? And I think, in general, if you think about uh, this type of analysis, you know, where you're building a predictive model, or where you're doing clustering, or any of this other stuff, um, there's kind of two very broad use cases. Uh, one is that you're actually trying to make some sort of prediction using the model that you've trained, where you're trying to use that model in the future to do something useful, right? So again, coming back to predictive modeling, which is kind of one of the more popular approaches, um, maybe you're trying to predict customer churn, and you go through and you train this whole model, and it predicts customer churn with 90% accuracy. And you say, that's great. You take the model that you trained, use that to score future customers to figure out, are they likely to churn, right? And so that's very broadly one kind of use case where you're taking a model that you've trained, you're using it to score future data points to actually run your business um, or do whatever it is, you know, if you're a scientist, whatever. Uh, the other very broad use case uh, is insight, right? So sometimes um, you're not really that interested in making predictions per se, you just wanna get a handle on what's going on uh, in your domain. So um, the goal might be simply to understand what is going on with customer churn. And then maybe someone in marketing can take that insight and do something on their own. Right? And so um, you'll notice I gave business examples, right, that reflects kind of where Big ML is coming from. Uh, I think that, um, but I do think that ML doesn't have to be painful it doesn't have to be difficult. It doesn't have to be a bunch of code. I think with the right tools, um, you can uh, enable the end user, you know, a power analyst at a, at a company, for example, uh, to actually take all this data that they've been analyzing in Tableau or Excel or whatever and actually apply these more advanced algorithms that, you know, up to now have been more the realm of PhDs you know, at big companies or, you know, in the realm of academia. Um, and so, yeah, I do think machine learning can be easy. I think it's a design challenge, right? The challenge is not, do we have the algorithms to do ABC? The, al the challenge is, can we actually design a workflow that's easy to use for someone who isn't a domain expert in, you know? Okay, thanks, yeah. David. Um, uh, Patrick, let me just jump down to you, because we, we hear a lot of terms thrown around, machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence. Can, can you differentiate these for, for everybody, or, or how, how are all these things similar, uh, the terms we always hear thrown around? Sure. Well, artificial intelligence is whatever the professional pundits at the time want you to think it is. Uh, it's gone through many different iterations from the late 50s and, until now. Uh, but it's usually kind of an umbrella term for you know whatever cutting edge technologies are happening that are allowing machines to do things that 10 years before we thought they wouldn't be able to do. Um, so in, in that regard now, you know, artificial intelligence is mostly about machine learning. It didn't used to be. Uh, AI used to be what we would call a symbolic approach where, uh, you know, you would take symbols to represent the things that you might want to represent and then create some kind of logical system and you would have a, a computer that could handle complex systems of logic in a way that no single person could. Um, and machine learning was a sort of niche part of, um, of that whole realm, um, but it really started to take off in, in the late 90s, partly with the success of neural networks and also with support vector machines and, um, and sort of clustering techniques that Dave was talking about. Um, and so now you see ML has taken over most of what we now consider to be AI. Um, and most of what you hear about in the press ha has to do with deep learning, which was a kind of augmentation of some techniques around neural networks that allowed neural networks to do all kinds of great things like give us 
self-driving cars and phones that recognize your faces. Let, let me stop you right there. What, yeah. what is a neural network and how, how does that relate to what you're talking about? Right. So, uh, well, I, I know that's a, that's could be a whole thesis <laughs> perhaps, but... Uh. <laughs> so, for, for those of you who know a little bit about statistics and machine learning and you're familiar with a generalized linear model or just a regression, um, you have a kind of affine function where you have a bunch of parameters with weights next to them and these lead to some kind of output function. And what a neural network is, is a whole bunch of these linked together basically on steroids. Um, so it's a, a whole bunch of linear regressions or uh, generalized linear models that are tied together in multiple layers and uh, using a, an algorithm called backpropagation will find some kind of error at the end of a network uh, backpropagate that error, tweak all of the weights throughout the network, and over the course of doing this through thousands of pieces of data, uh, hopefully we'll come with a much better representation than you would be able to get with just a single linear model. It's probably more of an explanation than you were looking for. No, that's great. That was great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so now that everyone totally understands neural networks, <laughs> um, let, me, let me come back to Jose. at and t um, Give, give everyone maybe an example of how machine learning has changed your changed your business as a, perhaps as a disruptor. Yeah. And, and, I'll, and I'll differentiate this perhaps, and I'll open this up to the whole panel, but up until now, and then maybe we'll talk about the future later. Absolutely. And I think that that's um, a good one example that is both recent and, and old, which is threat analytics, which is related to how companies are exposed to, to, to security threats to attacks by malicious entities across uh, the internet that will will try to target your website or your your internet assets or in, your internal assets as a company so at and has already set up a security solutions business around helping companies handle that security so that they don't have to have a security operation center populated with hundreds uh, ideally of uh, security experts being able to single out the, the, the attacks and, and being able to then respond to those. That has been running for a while and of course the way this is done it is mostly manually by having people staring at a big dashboard of, 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 of uh, um, threats and kind of having that, that feeling that, that the guy operating the, the, the dashboard is the guy that is going to push the button to, to kind of uh, go ahead and, and solve, try to solve the problem. What is coming now with the use of machine learning and, and other techniques, similar techniques, is automating and providing those operators with uh, an assisted set of predictions of what things may be happening, either in the things that the operator is seeing or in, in parts of the network that is impossible to keep track by looking at the screen, and then be able to, to be much more effective at that. So it is actually providing kind of a 400 people uh, security operation center in one to assist with just the one guy. Mm -hmm. That is one, one real world example we're using for that. Okay. Thanks. Um, Ed, I'll, I'll, come to, I'll come to you um, and uh, maybe just ask you for another example, uh, maybe a real world example of machine learning that, that people in the audience could relate to. Okay. Okay, that's, that's an easy one, actually. Thank you for it. <laughs> so, uh, the hard ones are coming later, don't worry. Yeah, probably my, my own journey. When I started looking into uh, companies using machine learning, I recall um, a company in New York by the name of X.AI. Uh, they uh, actually have a, an AI solution which is solving the problem of scheduling. So I met Dennis Mortensen, the CEO of this company, uh, four years ago. It was, uh, I was looking at the, at the company as a potential investment or uh, trying to understand what were the fundraising, uh, what, what was their, uh, their financial status, but I arrived late for that opportunity. Uh, nevertheless, I met Dennis and I wanted to understand a little bit better where their uh, artificial intelligence solution was. That was, again, almost four years ago. Uh, X.AI now is running very successfully after, after two uh, uh, financing rounds. This email bot that will schedule everything for you. So I've been testing this, this solution. Actually, I'm using it professionally for my work. When I need to meet someone, and, uh, I use this bot in order to schedule meetings. And uh, it was surprising to me. Actually, last year, uh, I agreed with Dennis to do this special test with the bot, like taking it to the limit for my work. 
So essentially, I use email primarily to communicate with customers, stakeholders, whoever else, other investors, whatever. And during one week, I only used Amy. Amy is the name of this bot, Amy Ingram, just to schedule everything for me. I was just triggering the whole uh, scheduling process, but then the bot itself took care of everything else for me. She's so, nice, me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it, it's amazing because in, in, in one week, I was able to schedule 16 real life meetings in four and a half days. No intervention from me other than the initial uh, email to trigger the. The, uh, the dialogue, everything was done by the bot. And uh, trust me, many people didn't realize that uh, it wasn't a person. So, so and again, this is uh, like, it happened around summer last year. So this is kind of uh, giving me the level of um, penetration that the machine learning or artificial intelligence solution can get into our daily lives. And for me, it was revealing. I was looking at the space from before, but then I noticed that uh, certainly this is something that is going to uh, like change or transform many different industries, many different use cases, and uh, given the speed at, at which uh, NLP and other solutions are advancing, uh, from a venture capital perspective, there is probably no better place to be, uh, given all the transformations that, that you can find. Um, I recall another example. This is coming from uh, the Super Computing Center in Barcelona, in Spain, my home country. I recall these, these guys are primarily researchers. But then they were uh, looking into um, data from an industrial facility, which is, a, you can think of it as a gigantic oven that takes care of getting rid of all the trash of a city. So uh, long story short, uh, I was impressed by what they did. In, they did just a predictive, a predictive model in three weeks to tweak, uh, to make some tweakings on some uh, simple things around these facilities, like temperature of the ovens, some. Uh, um, uh, chemicals and uh, doses of those chemicals, uh, when to be applied, or what about the quantity, simple efficiencies using like traditional machine learning models, and the total uh, savings were in the range of $10 million. So again, simple things, in, in fact, because uh, machine learning, uh, or the traditional machine learning is actually uh, very well proven algorithms and models that have been literally there for decades, that now, because we have the computing capacity and uh, the uh, uh, tools to effectively apply it to use cases out there are driving incredible, incredible savings. All right, I'll, I'll open this up to the panel. Um, can anyone give an example or, or uh, uh, illustrate maybe where, let's say, let's say in 10 to 15 years, an application of machine learning that might surprise people? Where do, where do you think we're going with this? And, I'll, and I'll, I think we can take a couple of maybe responses on this, but I'll open it up to anyone that wants to start. I mean, I'll, we, we hear about autonomous cars, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's maybe the logical one, but... but I can yeah. take it if you sure, want. Sure, sure, go ahead. All right. uh, have you seen the movie Her? Does it ring any bell? Okay. There is a startup here in San Francisco called Replica. Uh, this is um, it's actually an amazing story. So uh, this lady, uh, she's European, I forgot uh, which country. She uh, was working with uh, his co-founder for many years uh, on uh, machine learning applied to bots. So they were um, having an MVP around a bot to assist in the, the restaurants, help restaurants in the reservations, simple things. So his, his co-founder, which uh, he was also her, her best friend, died in an accident. So uh, this lady took all the messaging communications that he, she had with uh, uh, her friend, uh, WhatsApp messages, email messages, everything, everything she had, all of it, and then reconstructed a bot to replicate her friend. That, that's, that is today, right? So this is happening as we speak. So now the company is, is pivoting and uh, actually uh, building that for anyone. If you have sufficient data, you can try to reproduce the conversation with someone that has passed away. So that, that gives you a level, a sense of where things are going, right? And I was mentioning this movie here because I truly believe that this is a future that will be possible some, at some point in the future. Maybe it will take many years and we can debate endlessly about when that is going to be happening. But I, I tr honestly believe that it's going to happen at some point in time. Patrick, give, give us another example if you have one. So, something, something that you think might revolutionize every day. I know that one is so emotionally yeah. compelling. Yeah. I'm, it's I'm hard, afraid it's to follow it up with something for now. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
No, I mean, I, I think the self-driving cars thing is a huge one. It's going to have all kinds of impacts on society, but, but also just, you know, the, the things that are going to free us from sort of the menial labor that we have to do, and I know everybody's afraid that, you know, uh, AI is going to take our, our jobs away, but I think it's also going to free us up to, you know, be able to do much more rewarding jobs and to do them uh, with less money and in a way that sort of evens the playing field for everybody to just be able to do things that they would prefer to do than go to whatever menial job they have to go to now. Um, you know, so I, I, I mentioned earlier on the phone, you know, one thing that I think that we might see is in terms of construction, uh, I absolutely expect that we'll have AI that will be able to drive robotics in much more advanced um, tasks that they, than what they're able to do right now. So, you know, right now we have robots that select packages and stuff, and of course we've talked about Amazon flying drones and being able to drop them off at your house. Um, but I think we'll also be able to, you know, have machines take over a lot of the sort of back-breaking jobs that we do now and things like, um, you know, you could have a, an AI system that constructs a skyscraper and, you know, can do it overnight uh, at a time when the construction is not bothering everybody who's trying to go to work and stuff. Um, and do it at a tenth of the cost of, of, of what it costs right now. Um, and that may not happen in 10 years, it may take 15 or 20, um, but I think we're definitely headed in that direction. Um, and that's something that needs to make us think about, you know, what kind of society we want to have and do that ahead of time and be prepared for these things to happen. Yeah. Um, okay, let me, let me follow up on that. Um, and uh, Jose or David, I'll let either, either of you guys take it whoever you want. Um, kind of what, what are the implications of machine learning as machines become smarter and smarter and, and take over everyday jobs? Um, you know, kind of what are the social and economic implications of that as you see them? Thank you. There's been a lot of discussion about this. You had Bill Gates talking about the robot tax recently. And it's not the sort of thing you would expect to hear from a billionaire necessarily. So it kind of made me kind of perk up and take notice. Um, I, you know, if, <laughs> if you look at uh, what's been happening in American politics, if you look at um, this sort of problem with middle class wage stagnation, um, if you look at things like the minimum wage going sideways in real terms for the last 50 years, uh, and then you add on top of that that like all these trucking jobs get automated. Right, all these truckers are now out of a job. Uh, where does that lead, right? And for me, it's so hard to reconcile all these theoretical and very well-meaning solutions, like you know, universal basic income, right, and all this kind of thing. I mean, um, basically cushioning people from all of these economic dislocations, right? It's great in theory. Then you look at Congress, and it's like, oh yeah, that'll happen, right? So, I. I'm optimistic in that I think there are solutions. I don't know that I'm particularly optimistic given uh, what's been going on in American politics. Trump, Trump hasn't tweeted out. <laughs> okay. uh, go ahead. Let me, let me try to offer a, a, I'm a pure optimist, so I always see the, 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 the glass half full. So my take on this is, of course, if, if we give enough time to be able to, to accommodate to the new, to the new new, to a new situation, to a new uh, horizon, then people will realize that some of these menial ta tasks that we are, we are subject to, and people in the room, you've been playing with machine learning and doing probably some data cleansing tasks. If you were given an, an assistant that will do the ETL tasks so that all of the nitty-gritty details of getting from the raw data to something you can actually use for your, your AI and machine learning techniques, you would probably go for that. As By the way, that's what we need for, I really do think that's what we need for a better world, is better data prep tools. That would like, so many millions of lives would ultimately be, no, I'm not even kidding, actually. And it, like is, so and it is, but, but I say that, that let, let's say, instead of looking at, at a horizon of 15 years, that could be five, five years ahead of us, so that all the 70% all the of the time that a typical data scientist spends in cleansing the data is not long, going, no longer going to be there, but on a different scale, that may not only happen to a already a knowledge-based uh, job, 
but it may go into areas which, which are not necessarily a knowledge professions, turn them into knowledge professions in a similar way that the, the Industrial Revolution from the 19th century into the 20th century changed basically an agricultural based economy with people actually losing those jobs and in, in actually blowing those fields, going now into factories to do something completely different, like building Ford cars. Uh, and yeah, there was a revolution, yeah, there was a change and a crisis and, and whatever, but we got through it and we, we got to the other side of it. And it was, in general, it was good. It's probably, there are probably a lot of opinions there and sustainability and whatnot, but that is, there was something before, there was a, the world was only conceived to be, you will move with the, with the horse, you would, you will work on your land, and there will be basically a a, um, a primary primary foods and matters uh, economy, and then we moved into something different. And well, move things. One of the things that I would say was the trend was speed. There was a speed before that, and there was absolutely another speed going forward. I can I, I would say that the main trend I I can imagine going forward is a speed. Just imagine the speed at which any crossing in any of our cities will work when all of the cars are self-driving cars and the infrastructure in that city is communicating with the cars. They will not have to stop for a traffic light. So there will be speed, 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 suddenly stopping for people to cross. <laughs> That's the kind of things that you may be able to perceive in, if you try to, to, to project into, into the future, speed. Okay, and, and Patrick, quick, quickly, is there anything you guys would, would add to that on the social or economic impl implications of uh, machine learning technology moving forward, if, if, if you want? Yeah. Well, I can talk about that all day. <laughs> <laughs> so I say quick, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, first of all, I'm, I, I'm like one of the only guys in Silicon Valley who doesn't think universal basic income is going to work. Um, just, just for reasons of, like, economically, I don't see how it's ever going to be sustained. Uh, David's not a good, I think he agrees with me. <laughs> well, um, it's like, uh, I think of it as prepaid unemployment, basically. So, <laughs> yeah. which you kind of need when jobs are changing all the time. Yeah. Right, right. Um, but I do think that we're going to have, you know, we're going to see ourselves moving towards a society where, for the first time in history, um, the economy is going to shrink. Uh, and automation of a lot of these menial jobs and stuff are going to mean that we don't have to work as, as much, we don't need as much money. We have to start getting used to a society where, you know, it's been everything's been growing, 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 and now it's going to start shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. And we don't need all the stuff that we do, that we used to need, you know, the money, the full-time jobs, uh, that sort of thing. But there are definitely going to be growing pains in in uh, you know getting to that. And um, as, as Luis was pointing out, you know, it was only a hundred years ago or so that the John Deere factory, you know, bought a company that makes diesel fuel engines and started to make self-powered tractors. At the time, 60% of the workforce in the, world, in the United States uh, were farmhands, and 20 years later we had a massive depression with massive unemployment because we had a society that wasn't prepared for the, you know, the sociological changes that were about to take place. And so there are always growing pains with these types of things, and they, there certainly will be now. And we can either try to fight it from a policy standpoint or prepare for it from a policy standpoint with education and you know just getting people on the same page of how things are going to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me uh, let me change change gears a little bit from uh, uh, to maybe something more practical for everybody in the room uh, from, from the theoretical. So and maybe as an investor, um, if I could ask you maybe to talk about from, from an investor perspective um, for a company or startup that's involved or applying machine learning. What, what are the, some of the things that you're, that you're looking at? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's a, a very interesting question. And actually, uh, the way we are looking now at companies uh, now, it's like a couple of years now, that we, we are looking at machine learning companies from two different angles. How horizontal is their technology stack and how vertical they are specifically solving a problem. The verticality of those companies applying machine learning provides value. So in the context of valuation of the company, actually for fundraising purposes, uh, the way venture capital is looking at them is uh, the closer you are to the customer, uh, the, uh, the better you are solving a specific vertical problem, the more value your company has. 
despite the fact that we are in the early days of machine learning and uh, the majority of the people is coming with some sort of solution that is not only just for one vertical, but they are applying that to one vertical. So what we see is that there is no standards in this industry. Uh, I like to put the example of the mobile industry because I've been working there for 20 years and uh, I recall when Nokia started getting into the game and Motorola was the big leader actually here in the US, then GSM uh, came to the market as the standard that actually changed everything forever in terms of the new wave of, uh, of uh, mobile phones before even the smartphones. But then you were relying on a standard, everybody was relying on a standard, manufacturers, carriers, everyone in the industry to drive the adoption of that technology. Machine learning is not anything like remotely similar to that. Uh, we don't have any standards yet. There is a ton of fragmentation. There is a ton of innovation happening as we speak. There are so many things coming, and so many things that are already there, but still not adopted. That this is, from a venture capital perspective, a huge uh, soil for, for new ventures. So being said that, what we need to do, or what we do uh, from an investor perspective, is to look at, uh, or you need to be very smart in terms of understanding how a company can define its trajectory based on these two parameters how horizontal is their technology, and how vertical can a specific uh, value propositions reach the market. So that you can calculate the return on investments and uh, things like that. And that's the reason why if you come up with a new algorithm or a new uh, like fundamental machine learning solution, you really need to be very smart in demonstrating to your investors that you have some specific vertical or set of customers that uh, you are addressing as a solution. I'm, I'm disappointed at because I'm an IP lawyer and you didn't say anything about patent protection. That's oh, okay. a critical fact. All right, right. Lawyer, that's, but that, that's okay. We'll do that. um, so you did you did mention a little bit about some of the fragmentation. Um, where where uh, I'll open this up to anybody, but where, where do you see that? Where do you see that going? Do you see do you see standardization um, happening and, and uh, maybe as a corollary? Um, are the trends more towards uh, proprietary technology or kind of open source sharing? Okay. And I'll open that up to whoever, but yeah. you can take it off if you want it. It's a great question, and I will ask my peers to help me out on this one. I just will trigger the dialogue. But yeah, it's sure, a sure. very, very interesting question. So, a um, couple of thoughts there. Um, so, we, this is early days of machine learning from all aspects, not only from the technology point of view, but also specifically from the adoption point of view. How many people out there is actually using machine learning? How ingrained is machine learning in their business processes? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is my own recollection. And uh, thanks, by the way, to BigML. Uh, they, they have been very helpful in uh, helping me understand what is the status of the market right now. And then, then I'll, I'll leave it to you to, to go on, on this explanation for the others. <laughs> so my recollection is, despite the fact that big data has been there like for almost a decade, and uh, people have been speaking about big data, from all different angles, when you sit with the corporations, which supposedly have been already investing a ton of money, resources, and they have their data analytics departments and a big, uh, um, a ton of knowledge and experience, they, they, my, my own recollection is that this is early days still, that they are still moving from uh, traditional data analytics into predictive analytics, but they are not yet there. They are um, right now investing heavily in machine learning but it's mostly exploration rather than having the machine learning process deeply integrated in the business processes. Uh, we need to leave aside all the big technology players and the usual suspects. They have been like there forever since they, their business has been depending on a ton of data and the internet. But the rest of the corporate um, uh, verticals are still, in a way, untapped. So that's one. And that's the reason why, for instance, big ML, in my humble opinion, and I may be biased here, <laughs> have been very smart in um, providing those visualization tools so that machine learning can be used like literally by whoever in a corporation that may not have all the data analytics background. And that will enable this second stage of adoption of machine learning which so far has been like confined to big uh, uh, expert data analytics. So that's, that's in my mind the next phase. Let me, uh, let me try to tie some threads together here. Um, if you think back to 2008 when Cloud Era launched and it was the first Hadoop company um, and that was sort of the start of several years of the big data hype cycle. Right? You think of the Gartner hype cycle, it's like the, um, 
the peak of inflated expectations and then the trough of disillusionment and then like the plateau of productivity, right? And so 2008 was sort of the starting line for all this emphasis on uh, data infrastructure, right? It's like, hey, we've got all this data in Hadoop. Wow, isn't that great? Let's all get our data in Hadoop, okay. Um, then the next logical question, I think, is, well, what are you going to do with it, right? What are you gonna do with all that data? You spent all this money you know, building your data infrastructure. Um, how do you actually get insight into that data? Um, and uh, as Ed mentioned, you know, if you are LinkedIn or Facebook or Google or whatever, you can hire a team of PhDs who will actually you know, hand code their own stuff and they'll get the answer for you, right? Uh, but what about the rest of the world? Um, and that's what we've started to see in the last couple of years. 2015 was very interesting because um, that was the year that both uh, Amazon and Microsoft launched their own cloud-based ML tools, right? Um, and it's because they see this trend of broader adoption, right? And they want to uh, sell to a wide audience. Um, and so that's like the 30,000 foot view, I think, is that, you know, first there was the big data hype, uh, and then it was like, now what? And the answer is, oh, okay, we all need to figure out how to do machine learning. And um, I do agree that it's early days. So to digress a little bit, uh, <laughs> I think I think what BigML is doing. If you ever play with the tool, it's basically, it's like Tableau for data science. You take your data, you put it in, uh, it trains these models, you get these nice visualizations. It's, the interface is really a visualization tool, um, kind of analogous to what Tableau is um, for pivot tables, right? Uh, and so, but I don't think that goes far enough, right? I think if we're really gonna see mass adoption um, on a huge scale, I think there's one more step beyond just having these good visualizations. I think it's um, just automating a whole workflow, right? So now why do I say that you can automate the whole, an entire machine learning workflow? Well, a bunch of you raised your hands earlier saying that you had some experience with ML. And so, you know, if you've ever trained a model, like you're doing a predictive model and you have your data and you have to choose an algorithm that you're gonna use to train your model. Right. Let's say you're doing supervised learning. So you say, I'm going to do a random forest, or I'm going to do an SVM, or whatever. Now, be really honest with me. Do you have an intelligent reason for picking one algorithm or the other? And the answer is probably not. Right. And then once you've trained that model, you know there's all this sort of parameter tuning that has to be done, and that is also totally brainless. Right. And so. Why not just automate all of that? There's no human intelligence really going into it anyway, right? I mean, yes, you understand the concepts of what you're doing. You don't want to train a bad model, right? You have some goal you're trying to achieve, but the idea that you actually have any special insight into like which algorithm to choose, which algorithm to choose, or how to tune the parameters, right? I think it's just not true in practice. Um, and so I think that's kind of what lies ahead on the road to mass adoption of ML is uh, this sort of meta-learning type of stuff, right? Where you have an algorithm that picks the algorithm for you mm -hmm. uh, and does a parameter tuning, or maybe you even have an algorithm that does the whole pipeline for you, right? Maybe you provide the bare barest sketch of what it is you want to do, and then um, the meta-learning algorithm takes over uh, and says, okay, we did this feature selection for you, and then we train this model, and you know, the best we were able to do with some sort of intelligent brute force approach was this. And you know, with the push of a button, you've got a good baseline, and then you can try to beat that with your own sort of <clears throat> manual efforts. Um, so that's what I see. Uh, there's clearly this trend of trying to get this out of the lab and into um, you know the hands of, of uh, just normal businesses, uh, and that's where I see things headed. Yeah. Okay. Oh, go, go yeah. Ahead. Just, yeah. Just, just to wrap up and follow up on, on, on David's uh, observations, I think, and also kind of linked to, to what Ed was saying before, if we try to look at this as the moment in which there was pre-GSM in the, in the mobile standards and then GSM comes and everyone tried to align from the vendor equipment to the service providers and everything, that is something that service providers such as AT&T and others in this case, will not only be limited to, to one industry, but every single industry will be touched by this. 
there's a need for that standard at some point to happen. Uh, right now, we're in the kind of storming and forming situation, so there's a lot of things going on. And even if AT&T at some point has been able to understand and apply these predictive models for security threats, that is one spark in the dark if we look at the whole set of problems that are available to any given company, especially for large corporations. So the moment in which we come to some through open source, through consortiums, to, to get some baseline of what could be the standard around uh, machine learning going forward, that will be the takeoff moment, in my, in my opinion. Okay, so we, have, uh, we have a few minutes left. Um, there, are a lot, there are a lot of entrepreneurs in this room, I think. Um, from the panel, I guess, what, what resources should people go to um, to, learn, to learn more about machine learning? To, to learn how they can apply machine learning to perhaps their business or, or you know, whatever they can to improve with whatever they're doing, just just from a resource standpoint here at Silicon Valley. Yeah, well, there are these great online courses. I particularly recommend um, Udacity and Udemy. Um, actually, a buddy of mine, a buddy of mine Larry Y, uh, W A I, has a great course up on Udemy, uh, Intro to Machine Learning. Um, and also play around with some of the uh, free or cheap tools out there. So Scikit-Learn is a, a great way if you know Python. Um, BigML, not that I'm biased, uh, but you can create a free account. And uh, it has an API if you want to write code. Um, and it has the uh, browser UI if you don't. And I find that playing around with um, these algorithms really helps my understanding. BigML will give you like a housewarming gift of a bunch of data sets. You get the Iris data set. You know, that enough said. So, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's all. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, free or very cheap resources out there. Yeah. Another great course. Just if, if, if there are a lot of people out there who are entrepreneurs and you want to sort of know more about machine learning, but you don't necessarily want to know, like, you know, how do you code a support vector machine and and that type of thing. And so there was one course that I pointed to my dad to. It was on Coursera, and I'm forgetting the name. But it's sort of sort of like a Intro to data science, but for you know non-mathematical types. Um, if that's sort of the, the level that you prefer to get at, where you can kind of learn, you know, what are all the different technologies and names and concepts that are involved. Um, other than that, another another great book um, that's by a, a crack machine learning person, but the book is really good at giving sort of high level. Um, explanations of machine learning and how it's evolved throughout the uh, ages is uh, Pedro Domingos's book, The Master Algorithm. Uh, it's a fantastic book. I highly recommend it. Um, and also, Jeff Hawkins, the guy who was the inventor of the Palm Pilot, uh, has another earlier but, but really interesting book that takes more of sort of a neuroscience angle called On Intelligence. Um, so th those, I think, are two really good high, high level uh, resources I would go to. And by the way, the book by Pedro Domingos, there is no single equation in the whole book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, th I think I think maybe now is a good uh, a good break time to to start uh, start questions. Let's hear it for our panel. So we want to take in as many questions as possible. So if you have a question, line up here. Step up to the mic, introduce yourself, ask away, and uh, we'll do Q&A all the way up to late 30. So. Uh, long with anthology, um, we, we play in AI through uh, IBM Watson, but my question is uh, not for myself because I'm married, but have you guys seen any um, solutions that allow people to speak uh, good solutions allow quick translation, like, you know, hey, are, are you free tonight? Or, you know, dating apps that do quick translation. Have you guys seen anything good? Because I've had several requests, but I said, no, nah, man, you're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> so have you seen any AI applied to language translation on a serious note? That works well, because if I use Google Translation, my day will be a three-headed monster. <laughs> That's, that's yours. <laughs> the best universal translator I know of is alcohol. <laughs> Communicate in any language. Yeah, well, that gets pretty expensive. 
Because some of these people are heavy. Right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's a good one, though. Somebody should make a, a translation app. You could probably just use the Google Translate API. Like I said, we tried that, and the date was a three-headed monster. No. <laughs> <laughs> There's really not really any good ones, so I thought maybe you guys have come across some good ones. But I think really it will come before the um, autonomous car because you can control the variables much better. You just control the language. Because with the driving cars, there's so many variables you can't control. Like my wife will put everything on the car in the next 20 years. This is about half of you over. <laughs> I can say that because he's not here. <laughs> Hi, so I have a question about how um, people are trying to understand machine learning. Um, you know, you can run some of these packages and they learn something, but how do you get a good intuition of what exactly is, is in there and, and how you propose to get that uh, to people? Um. So I really, I really do think that playing around with the algorithms uh, is a great way to develop your intuition. If you actually take a data set, train a decision tree, evaluate the decision tree, you know, look at the confusion matrix, understand what you're doing, you know, that's going to give you a lot more concrete foundation than you know, trying to understand like the math behind the bias variance decomposition or something. Right? It's just, it's not. Uh, there's a big difference between. You know, reading about it in a book and trying to like yeah. digest a bunch of math and actually diving yeah. up. But what about yeah. like algorithms like SVMs, deep networks, and stuff like that? I mean, you can't you can't do that decision tree uh, with those. Yeah, well, it depends what um, what your application is, right? If you're just trying to do classification or supervised learning and all that kind of stuff, decision tree is a great place to start. It's easy to visualize. Mm -hmm. um, you can kind of see what it's doing. The output's very human interpretable. Um, and so, uh, again, not to uh, tout big ML too much, but you know, you can just go try that out. There's some data sets that it comes with that are kind of the standard starting data sets and you can play around with it. Um, I do think there's some general concepts you need to learn, right? You need to learn about the concept of training a model, scoring a model, evaluating all this kind of stuff. Yeah, but understanding what's inside is, is is, is what's tough. It's, so yeah, the decision tree for the simple, you know, one node model. Uh, sure. So, so you, you, you can understand that yeah. a little better. But you know, once they start getting more complicated with many nodes and, and so on, and they're interacting, then it's, it's much harder to... You know. yeah, did you want to yeah, go ahead? Yeah, just uh, I, I don't know exactly how that will be solved. What I can say is that that will be very relevant going forward because of the needs to be to have processes that are auditable. For instance, if you're given a credit score and due to that credit score, your insurance goes up or your loan is denied, now we are instorming and forming, but as we mature, there will be a need to be able to get in front of our court eventually and explain that everything was done transparently and everything, every decision by the machine can be tracked and can be explained. So I don't know how, but I, I think it will be relevant. By the way, I um, I personally under, I personally think of understanding ML. As, it's not about the algorithm to me. It's about understanding these sort of high level approaches, right? So, you know, I see a random forest and an SVM as a, in a neural net as you know tools for supervised learning, right? And so, um, I think that again, just picking an algorithm and, and playing around with it. I mean, obviously, there's unsupervised learning too, but just to give that example, right? Um, it's not really about the algorithm to me. It's about understanding these concepts of um, uh, training the model, making sure you don't overfit it, evaluating it, um, yeah, you know, making sure it's not too complicated, all that type of stuff. I don't yeah. think I answered your question. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I just wanted to address the, you were asking about like deep neural networks, and there is one technique that they use to do a kind of fMRI on deep neural networks, which is where it requires you to have some labeled data, but if you have you know, some inputs where you know what at least some of the values are on those inputs, 
uh, you can feed them into your neural network that has already been trained on the data and look and see what lights up in the network, uh, just like you would do if you were taking an MRI of somebody's brain. Um, so that you feed in something, you say, I know this is a cat, and so you look and you see what are the nodes that seem to light up for a cat. Uh, and then you throw another thing, you're like, this is a hammer, and you look at what lights up for a hammer. And by doing things discriminatively in this way, you can get a pretty good idea of what the various nodes are in your network are doing. It's not like there will be you know, a single set of nodes for a hammer. These representations are all distributed, but they'll give you an idea of how those distributions change among the nodes, given the different things that you're trying to classify. Yeah, the, I mean, there's methods. Um, uh, what, what is it? It's... Um, uh, 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 I'm, as soon as I walk away, I'm going to remember the name right now. I'm not going to. Uh, Sorry, we can talk about it later. Yeah. Um, uh, it's. Uh, I forgot the name. But where you kind of piece it off, right? You, you, you block off and you just have a little bit of, uh, of the pattern and you send it to the network and you see what it lights up. And that little piece, another. Oh, just yes. to try to uh, de yeah. decompose. But that's yeah. kind of a piece. You don't really understand exactly what's in the network. That now we're doing and why it's, uh, it's uh, yeah that's always going to be a little elusive the, the yeah. exact understanding yeah. absolutely yeah thank you thanks hey, Ed I think this question is to be directed towards you you mentioned about standards and you and I both are come from telecom background and I've had to work on a couple of standards boards um, the idea of creating a standard or standards in general for uh, machine learning, where would you begin to do that and why would you want to create standards? I mean, because if you can create a standard, you want interoperability standards for machine learning to be able to do, if you're going to do, let's say, machine learning for big data analytics on ERP, does the ERP platform then have to coincide with that? Or are you going to do buying decisions, big data analytics, machine learning to predictive uh, things like that, or even in the telecom networks, how do you create those standards for this? Because it's so new, and how would they be applied? Where, where would you start with something like that? OK. So um, two questions. The second one is why. I think it's even more important. So the why is, uh, as we have seen in other industries, as soon as we have some sort of agreement with the different stakeholders, like the standard itself, we all can comply to that, to that standard and build the industry faster develop things faster and we can be more efficient in uh, developing the ecosystem. So for machine learning also those rules apply as well. Now where to start is a tricky question because there are so many things within machine learning that would need to be tackled. I think that uh, in particular talking about deep learning and neural networks, uh, there are so many different variations and methods. There is also this uh, need to be able to transfer the learning from one neural network to another. I didn't see anything like uh, tools or standards or mechanisms to really share that in, in any way. I think that's going to be important. So at the end, we are relying on different neural networks to take decisions. Those are actually uh, pools of knowledge. And uh, one could be a very good neural network for NLP. The other one will be a very good neural network for uh, cellular cars. At some point of time, you need to communicate both systems. There is nothing there, right? Uh, we have silos, we have fragmentation, but there is nothing there. There is not an ecosystem in which we can share what we know or share a, a specific technologies or methodologies. So I believe that we could start with that. Simple things like how we share um, the capabilities of the different uh, machine learning methodologies that we have right now. Ah, OK, OK. And when you're talking about when you're sharing the information, um, what about people, let's say there are standards, it's going to take years to actually start developing these standards, getting standard boards or whatever. Who's going to handle that, right? The IEEE or anybody like that, who knows, right? It would have to be maybe create a whole other machine and do machine learning standards board, do you think? Or, and then how does that apply? I mean, because there's going to be a lot of proprietary pushback okay. on this too. So that's, that's what I mean. Okay, okay, good question. Uh, if you're coming from the telecom industry, Yes, there were some standards like DSM, for example, for example, that were like defining the industry for all these things and worked very well. But there were many failing standards as well. You may recall when once the phones started to have internet access, there were many attempts to standardize other things. They didn't work that well. 
So the market did something different. I, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to say that for machine learning, there will be more de facto standards uh -huh. than actually top down driven standards. Okay. And that's my, my impression. If I may add something to this, I think that on the Y, I can add also the vendor lock in. So in order to avoid being locked in in just one vendor for your whatever machinery you need, that's a usual recurring theme to right. try to, to have several providers of whatever you use. And uh, to the how, I think that there's, there's an element there. If there's no shared infrastructure, like in a mobile radio spectrum or in a IETF standard related to, to the IP technology and the, 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 let's say, network and physical layers, it is difficult to build the other layers on top of right. just thin air. So it will probably look more like um, Oasis or some, some of the like OAuth, so kind of the, the, the security mechanisms, kind of those other soft, absolutely soft um, application layer standards in any case. Ah, okay, okay. Thanks. Just have one more thing. Yeah. <laughs> Another sort of alternative to standards that I've been becoming excited about is using blockchain. Yeah. to sort of allow the community to create their own standards. You know, we've, we've seen this done. There used to be Encyclopedia Botanica where a bunch of experts, you know, decided what a subject was about and put it in a book. And now we have Wikipedia where the community at large just decides what our collective knowledge is. Uh, and the same could be done using blockchain and standards so that, you know, people put various things into the blockchain standard and whatever catches hold, catches hold and perpetuates throughout the blockchain. Okay. Well, in that sense, wouldn't it also, you would also need requirements, standards, let's say, for M2M for security. They're doing special security processing. Then you would need standards for doing special transactional processes, right? And everything, every step of the way, like banking industry, like you're saying, blockchain is big, and becoming big right now in the banking industry. So then maybe the machine to machine would have to require standards or standardization for each one of these applications like going over cell phone technology or things like that in the autonomous cars there might have to be like you say different layer different layers of standards as per each application would you would you think about the, something like that or i think the machines could just work it out among themselves especially yeah. <laughs> the machines, they, you know, they'll just enter stuff into the blockchain like here's my stuff and other machines will have to work out what it is, and uh, you know, with enough, that happening enough times, it'll it'll work out. It's kind of <laughs> it's kind of will not need any other That's vendors. Right. <laughs> still have to find something else. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. Hi, my name is Josh Brown. I'm an instructor of higher education at the University of Virginia. Um, Matt asked you all earlier, particularly, to project forward for a decade or two and uh, surmise for us what the impacts of this is going to happen on, on uh, society. Much of your response is pretty much uh, characterized broad social changes or labor skills that individuals were going to need to enter into these corporations with. Can you tell me what somebody like myself uh, and others in my field are going to have to do to the field of higher ed in order to either prepare for the broad social changes that you're hypothesizing or the skills that are going to be necessary to compete in a market with uh, where this is so dominant. Um, so I think in the case of uh, teaching, uh, it has the advantage of requiring empathy. And so. Um, if you're looking for something that is hard to automate, uh, I would put empathy uh, right at the top of the list. Um, and of course, there's all this stuff with online courses, right? Um, certainly, uh, there are some concerns about, um, you know, uh, uh, commoditization, right? The fact that it's just another thing that people consume online, but, yeah. um, you know, actually, being a teacher, uh, I think it's going to be a long time for a robot uh, can do that type of thing. And I think Bill Gates actually made this point about empathy yeah. being uh, a good, right. yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, I, I would say that um, together with um, other kind of creative or, or profession that has a degree of creativity in it, like musicians or, or 
journalists that at this point, I read an article today that was already naming five categories of professions that could be just evaporate, and evaporate in the next uh, uh, decade. I mean, I don't see, I mean, again, I need to re reiterate, I am an optimist, so what I think is we will have assistance to do what previously we were doing just by, by ourselves, right. and go through all of the cre creating a curriculum for the year and going through the things, or for the musician, having a, or, the, or, the, or the author, having a blank slate in front of you, having to start with every single word from the headline to, to everything. You will have assistance to, to kind of help you through the most tedious parts of the work and probably <coughs> concentrate on, on what is the value add that you add. Empathy may be one of the okay. big, big points, but it's not, not only limited to that because, of course, in, what you, in the way you teach, in your teaching style, or in your writing style, on your, your coding style, there's a lot of you. So right. All of those things that, that kind of need that personal author trait to be, to be there, you, you will have like a, yeah, a musician instead of having a piano, a piano having a, a, a full symphony with you, with a kind of a synthesizer. So that's, that's, that's the kind of thing that, that the closest to an analogy I could think, instead of a, of a classic piano, having now a synth, synth with a lot of possible sounds on it. Yeah, I'm with David and Jose on this one. Uh, you know, the, there was an article in the New York Times that you, that you just made me think of a couple, couple weeks ago about a startup that is has AI creating music. And while it made some really nice sort of ambient background music, this AI is not writing Leonard Cohen songs. You know, it lacks that sort of top-down <laughs> emotionality that really you know creates music that gets us and is not just something in the background of the elevator. Um, so I think, I think basically the, the jobs that are now the most overvalued will probably stay overvalued. And that's, you know, being some kind of superstar in sports or on TV or, you know, whatever. There's some people who go home at night and they're like, I don't know what I did today, but I made a lot of money doing it, so I'm just going to keep doing the same thing. And that will probably still continue to be the case. On the other hand, and, and this is where teaching comes in, I think, I think some of the most undervalued professions are going to be raised up in value. At least I hope that they are. And teaching is one of those. These, these are the ones that you guys are talking about that require a great deal of understanding of the human condition and you know what it's really like to be humans. And so, you know, teaching is one of those. Uh, being a therapist is one of those. I would like to see lots more people going into therapy and getting it covered by insurance or or that kind of thing. Just being able to talk to other people about, you know, the condition that they're in and what their problems are. Oh, it's so um, hard being president, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that guy definitely gets there. Um, so, yeah, I, I think a lot of these, like, currently undervalued, you know, uh, elementary school teachers, uh, all that sort of thing, will, will hopefully become more valued. And so as, as for you, as a higher education, you know, professor, I would hope that you would... Um, Continue to value, you know, these sort of higher level things that only people can really understand. Machines are never really going to understand those. As opposed to, you know, teaching people algorithms and stuff like that. You know, my daughter is learning coding right now. She thinks it's fun. That's great. I don't think it's actually going to be a useful skill. It was useful to me in 1983 when I was doing it. Um, but nowadays, I think machines are going to kind of take that over. And so I think it's really, you know, having a higher level understanding of what makes us human going to be important in the future going forward. Great, thank you. Before we get to the next one, let me, let me just follow up. What about medicine? Where, where, where is machine learning going to take us? And that, I mean, is that, does that become automated? I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. My hope with medicine is that it's going to become, uh, it, we're going to be able to bring costs down. Uh, because a lot of what costs something that, you know, you, you go and you get an MRI. Uh, I had to have three of them last year. And they're like, you know, 6,000 bucks a pop. And the good part of that is just the person who has to analyze the MRI that they have to pay a lot of money to say, like, no, you don't have a tumor, you know, thank goodness. Um, but uh, if you can have a machine do that part of it, you know, and then still have the doctor do the part that, you know, doctors do best, um, but, you know, a combination of knowledge and bedside manner and being able to bring everything together into a holistic view of health, that's something that it's going to be very difficult for us to create a machine to, to do. Okay. Yeah. Hey, uh, I have a question about the machine learning on the cloud. 
Um, so the better matching that the, the two players is uh, Anton and Microsoft and Google is also a big player uh, uh, right now. So, so my question is that uh, for the cloud ML, so do you think that uh, eventually all the companies will move their journey uh, product to the cloud? So if not, what do you want from that happening? So, so, so what are yeah. the key features that we can attract to the customers? Yeah, so, um, yeah, you mentioned uh, Amazon and Microsoft. I would also put Big Bell in that category. Yeah. And uh, I think that there are so many things that are convenient about ML in the cloud, right? Um, first of all, and this is kind of underappreciated, um, the typical size of a training set you're using, it's not petabytes or terabytes, yeah. right? A typical training set that you're using for machine learning is going to be maybe gigabytes, and that's actually quite <coughs> big, right? And so it's totally manageable to take that amount of data and maybe compress it and upload it into the cloud, right? Now, making all the cloud, making the cloud secure and everything, that's, you know, it's Amazon's problem, right? But whatever, it, it'll happen, right? And so from the user's perspective, it's, there's a lot of convenient things about ML in the cloud. Again, number one is the relatively small data size of the training sets, which makes it easier to get the data into the cloud. Um, number two is obviously you don't have to install any software. Uh, number three is that you know you automatically get access to a cluster of machines, right? So by not having to install it on prem or on your local machine, uh, you can do things like you know you open up your web browser and you've got access to a cluster of 100 machines and they run your random forest in parallel, right? And so you know you run a hundred tree random forest like that, but as it executes in parallel on 100 machines, and the user doesn't even have to know about any of this, right? Uh, so I do think that there's a lot of compelling reasons to do. Uh, ML in the cloud and the, and the sort of traditional objections which are well you know security issues those strike me as totally solvable um, and then again the data set size is really not that big right and this is a, again a funny sort of underappreciated thing like you might have terabytes or petabytes in Hadoop right what you're trying to do when you're querying that data system is actually get a condensed training set that may only be gigabytes and then it's that that you're actually Trading your algorithms on. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, but for the companies that they are already uh, on the cloud, uh, so the, uh, they are uh, they are already on the cloud, right? So, so it totally makes sense they uh, start using the machine ML. So, like Netflix uh, uh, had all their stuff, uh, so the, had all their data in the cloud. Oh, yeah. So, if you're a heavy Amazon user, right? Yeah. Um, I mean. You know, if your ML provider is also hosted on Amazon, the data transfer is going to go faster. That's kind of the, the icing on the cake. Yeah. 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 Just, yeah. Just, uh, <laughs> if I may add something, it's it, coupled with the cloud, no cloud, uh, like a private public um, decision, there's how, how are you going to apply your machine learning? So, who is going to be your provider of, of machine right. learning technology and the data? It's not just the size of the data, it's the ownership of right. the data. Because of course, you know these things, and especially building on my experience, who owns the data plays such an important role when you're trying to apply to a particular business need that becomes a central topic. And I will have my chip shot here with AT&T. We recently announced the Indigo um, initiative, which tries to tackle that zone in which you need to have not only the capabilities to connect securely different partners or different legal entities that have data in different cloud instances. Mm -hmm. yeah. For that, there are already solutions based on VPN and whatnot. But then you need to be able to, to compute on all those data sets in a way that is secure, that goes through several <coughs> insurance providers and is able to provide a, a solution to that. But that is going to become, in our, in, in our way, of thinking through this, through this, for instance, um, take a complex ecosystem like eHealth. You've got the doctors, the patients, the hospitals, all of the device providers, the fMRI provider. Everyone in that ecosystem claims that has ownership of the data. In the middle, the patient is lost. I just want my diagnosis to be done. So just align yourselves and get, get your app together so that we have a, a compute on my data Hold by so many providers in between. So I see the appearance of that, and, and Ethan is making a bet on that. Like, how do you actually get all those things in the same place? 
from the data to the connectivity to the compute. And that compute being machine learning is one of the instances in which that will be relevant. I see. Okay. So, so, so the takeaway is that the, the security and the privacy uh, is the major concern uh, of coming to make the decision. Thanks. Thank you so much for the amazing content. Well, I guess I have two questions. Uh, first, I would like you to expand a little bit on the topic of uh, machine taxation and the anxiety and her that is around um, AI and people losing their jobs in contrast to uh, the gains that we can get from automation and productivity. How do you ba bring balance to that? And uh, what would you like to see in near future in terms of leadership to um, make the lawmakers believe that, hey, AI is not that bad. And the second question is about where would you like to see AI in terms of, uh, actually, this question is for you, Ed, uh, when it comes to investments. Do you like to see AI in more controlled environment, like B2B applications, or you know you're okay with B2C? I heard that you talked about Excel AI, so it's a B2C application. Where do you like to see people, uh, AI grow first? Thank you. Okay. So I'll take the last one first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, where do I want to see AI going? Um, well, from from an investor perspective, um, so much going on. So this is a difficult question in a way. So I think that to your point, there are many things uh, touching the human problem in right. a way that uh, AI is not even considering because it's not there and uh, we are still in the early days. So I think that uh, feels like uh, humanities, uh, philosophy, actually uh, ethics, all those kind of things are, are, we need a new framework for that. Once we have AI out there and we have some different cars and we have people not any longer capable of doing the previous work, so the jobs because the machines are taking over and all those kind of things. You have a, and by the way, you have machines around you, around you that know better about you than you about yourself. Uh, I think that many things are going to change, and then uh, we may need to think like at a higher level, what are the things that we need uh, from a human perspective? Like, uh, for instance, philosophy. Is there, is there a need for a new philosophical framework? Um, I, I, I'm assuming there is, but no one is investing there, or no one is going there yet. Despite the fact that uh, I think that it's, uh, the majority of the companies and investors have a clear vision and view of what is going to happen, and the debate will be when, but there is no more debate that is going to happen, uh, those kind of high level things are, or initiatives are not happening yet. There is more about, there is, what I have seen is more driven by fear than an actual good analysis and good investment proposition in a way oriented towards that. So I think that it's a, it's a green field for anyone that really wants to lead those initiatives. Actually, one of the things I'm thinking for my children is, uh, to your point, Patrick, I don't think that coding is going to be any useful in the future. It was for me as well. I'm a master engineer, but still I was, I was good programming. But I don't think that programming is going to be like the skills you need in the future. Uh, but uh, being able to understand what these new technologies and AI in particular and do good for humanity and build the next layer of uh, uh, philosophical, ethical uh, um, uh, frameworks that we will need will be a phenomenal task that someone needs to tackle. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, ever since the invention of the printing press, you are either work for the machine or you use the machine. I don't think that that is going to change. You, you either need to learn how to program those machines, whatever it is that the, the paradigm in the future, or you will be subject to somehow being told where to go, what to do by some machine or some sort. Sure. So, so you foresee that you, you foresee us becoming cyborgs in um, a few decades? Well, you, you will make a choice. <laughs> All right. But uh, but I think that the, the ethics and um, the whole framework that that regulates how do we have policy and and, and law that it's the state of law as we know it needs to change because there is it has been raised by the debate around. Bill Gates and others that have been mentioned, there, there is a real danger for an inequality to be built into the system, sure. and just from a technology angle. If we don't bring other trades into this discussion, sure. it may be the case that only those with access to a technology and able to program those machines 
have the means to, to, to be in that side of the equation, all of the others will be on the serving side. That is, no. I just, one final thing I just have to point out. I think most people would agree, people should not be driving cars anyway, right? <laughs> and so, if you want to talk about ethics, it's actually unethical to let people do too much driving. And so, I think we're going to see that kind of, uh, it's a bit of a, a reverse perspective, right? Elon Musk actually made this point about, um, you know, rolling out uh, the uh, super fancy adaptive cruise control for Tesla, right? He said it would be unethical not to do it because it's going to actually save lives uh, in the balance. Yeah. Yeah. As many people were killed by guns as were killed by cars last year. Well, we have no constitutional right to cars. That's right. All right. Thank you. Yeah. One more. Hello, uh, I'm from Brazil. I have a startup, and I think Patrick in the beginning mentioned something. Whoops, the line. Mentioned something about um, summarizing text using AI. Is that correct? Okay. So what my startup do is um, we do audible blogs. So we offer uh, the audio services for for the bloggers. And one of the things that we are getting from the from feedback from them is that they are asking for, uh, actually the listeners, they are asking for a summarized uh, version of the articles. So is it being uh, done? Um, and another question, um, those um, solutions out there, they're offering the uh, shorter versions from uh, audiobooks, are they using AI or still using and how can we apply that? Sorry if it's a stupid question. I'm not That's sure. Cool. So your, so your first question fine. is, um, I mean, you want not just a transcript, right? Because you could definitely get a transcript of, of the audio blog. Um, but you're talking about having it summarized so you have a short version of whatever was discussed in the yes. audio blog. Yeah. So there are definitely summarization techniques where they will do things like you know, just extract the most salient sentences or, you know, the most interesting parts of whatever was said in the blog and be able to just sort of give you a summary in terms of those most interesting extracted sentences. Um, there are other more sort of generative techniques that would allow you to, um, you know, take a blog and sort of, um, for example, at BigML they're using a, a technique called LDA to sort of take a large document and you know split it into topics so that you could then um, perhaps provide some kind of summary of what the topics are and then allow people to use that to drill down into the particular parts of the blog that are talking about that topic. So uh, that's another possible thing that you could do. And then the second question was? If they are already, if people are already using it to, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the like twelve minute type of service, like book. Oh, right, like take take a book and yeah. uh, congest okay. it down. Mm -hmm. um, they just want to start to get abstract. Get abstract. Yeah, that's and, get abstract. Yeah. and they're using machine learning for that. I don't know how far they are. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. My question is, can we use machine learn to do that with big text and summarize it in a in a way that's going to make sense for people? I think yes, that you definitely could. Nice. Um, yeah, if you want to send me an email, I can try yes. to point you to some, some resources yes. on that. Yes, very good, thank you. Yeah, and just to follow up what he said about uh, topic modeling. Um, so, you know, one way to summarize uh, the text of a document, so, I mean, you have a transcription, it's text, right? And now you want to actually extract some meaning out of that text, yes. right? Um, so one way to do it is through actually trying to understand the sentences, right? And that's sort of what you guys are doing. Uh, another way is to um, just kind of look at the frequency of the words that occur in the different um, uh, books or podcasts or whatever, these different transcripts. Um, and you get a sort of topic profile for each one. And um, I typically find that when you apply this technique, um, you end up with very human readable topics. So there's one, and the topic becomes kind of a signature for the document. Right, so you have one document that's about like uh, parenting and babies and whatever, and you have another one that's about I don't know, like 
sci-fi and lasers and whatever, but you can actually just take the documents, right? You don't need to like train on Wikipedia or anything. You just feed the documents to this topic modeling algorithm, and it finds these patterns in the works. Oh, uh, interesting. And so that's uh, BigML actually has that if you want to take it first. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's falling. <laughs> Let's give it up for a panel. Let's give it up for our awesome moderator, Matt Berkowitz. Let's give it up for Sherman Sterling. Let's give it up for our audience. Let's give it up for Tim, our videographer. Let's give it up for me. <laughs> I think that covers uh, everybody. Our uh, panelists will stick around to take some questions one-on-one. -on -one. The uh, YouTube video will be available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash idea to iPhone, in about three weeks, right, Tim? And uh, as a courtesy to our hosts, we'd like to leave the room by 9 p.m., 9 p.m. So uh, thank you so much for coming, and see you next time. <laughs>